Um, sometimes people say about the science and religion field that it's combining two things that don't really belong together, two things that don't fit very well. So on that note, I thought I would include a picture of Nicholas of Cusa gazing at the multiverse. Um, <laughs> he is, um, as I will go on to say, a 15th century uh, neo uh, Neoplatonist uh, theologian and philosopher, and as people will probably know, he um, is very important and very central in terms of multiverse thought. Um, as Michael just pointed out, I very, very recently started my PhD at Cambridge um, two weeks ago. So um, I think Bernard and also Max Tegmark at MIT have talked about embryonic bubble multiverses or universes. So perhaps this can be considered as kind of an embryonic bubble that I'm testing out today and hopefully nobody bursts it. <laughs> um, <coughs> so this is just an overview of what I'll be talking about. Um, I'm going to say, say a few more words about the idea of the multiverse and also what I mean by a metaphysics of participation. Then I'm just going to go uh, through a few key thinkers who I think have some interesting and important things from theology and philosophy to bring to thinking about the multiverse. And you'll notice that they are you know, ancient and medieval thinkers. And I think it's, you know, it's an interesting exercise to see what kind of insights from ancient and medieval theology and philosophy we can bring to bear, not just in terms of the multiverse, but in terms of the science and religion dialogue more generally. And finally, I'll conclude with a few key concepts um, which I think um, have already been discussed in, in some of the earlier talks. Um, so as Professor Carr has already explained to us, and as he's written about in his book, Universe or Multiverse, modern cosmologists are increasingly receptive to the notion that the universe we inhabit is one of many, or perhaps one of an infinite set of universes. And although the multiverse would seem to have profound theological implications, the idea, as we've heard already today, has typically been invoked to reject the anthropic principle, whereby the fine-tuning of the universe is seen as evidence of God's existence, on the basis that, of all the existing universes, we happen to inhabit the one with suitable physical constants for life. So as I've got up here on this slide, um, my purpose for this brief talk is really twofold. Um, the first point I want to make is to argue against the kind of false dichotomy that Professor Carr mentioned in his um, speech against the false dichotomy of a single divinely created universe on the one hand or a mindless multiverse on the other hand. And in doing so, I want to build on some recent quite preliminary theistic multiverse interpretations. Um, people like Robin Collins, John Hort, Keith Ward, Don Page have in the last five, six, seven years begun to make a theistic case for the multiverse. And I'm trying to extend that in some ways to suggest that the existence of a multiverse need not preclude God, but might be seen as emblematic of divine creativity, rationality, and beauty. In other words, the multiverse can be thought of as compatible with Christian theism. <laughs> and the second point I want to make, and this is probably a more interesting and important point, more of a metaphysical point, is to begin to outline a response to an uh, American philosopher called Mary Jane Rubinstein, who recently published a very good book on the history of religious and scientific multiverse thought called Worlds Without End. And she observes in this book that the multiverse proposal asks more interesting and more pressing questions than whether, whether the universe has been designed. And she says this because of the multiverse kind of has a paradoxical ontology. It seems to entangle the one and the many, um, or particularity and complexity. And as anyone interested in theology and philosophy will know, these have always been key issues and key dilemmas in theology and philosophy. And recent theistic multiverse interpretations that I just mentioned, I think have been somewhat tentative and insufficiently metaphysical. So in light of this, what I want to do is, as I say, draw on some platonic and medieval theological resources to demonstrate that a, or to suggest, not demonstrating anything yet, but to suggest that a metaphysic of participation might enable a fruitful theological if not recovery of the multiverse, then at least an engagement with the multiverse or an account of the multiverse. The premise of metaphysical participation, that something has its reality by virtue of something other than itself, is quite clearly fundamental to multiverse thought. Yet this way of thinking about the multiverse 
seems to have been overlooked in contemporary theology. And that's perhaps unsurprising because as I'll go on to discuss, um, the idea of metaphysical participation has been neglected in much post 17th century Western philosophy. It's fallen out of fashion somewhat. <clears throat> so when we think about the multiverse, it's useful to have a conceptual framework. And I think Bernard may have been about to talk about this, but he ran out of time conveniently for me. So this is Max Tegmark's hierarchy of multiverses. And this is just a, a good way of conceiving of the idea of, or different ideas of the multiverse. Max Tegmark is, a, I think, a mathematical physicist, cosmologist at MIT. And the first thing I want to say about this is it's interesting, as far as my proposal is concerned, that Tegmark even has a hierarchy of multiverses. Because Platonic and Christian medieval ontology assumes or assumed a hierarchy of being that we no longer kind of take for granted. It assumed different degrees of reality. So for us today, you know, this table just exists. This podium exists. I exist. Bernard Carr exists. But back in Platonic, Neoplatonic, sorry, Neoplatonic ontology, there were degrees of reality, degrees of existence. So there was a chain, chain of being that extended from you know, animals, plants and animals at the bottom, to humans, to angels, and finally to God. So I think it's theologically and philosophically striking that Tegmark has also chosen to talk about multiverses in terms of a kind of a hierarchy, a chain of increasing levels of reality or multiversality. Um, so the hierarchy is ordered as follows. Level one is simply based on a spatially infinite cosmological model with infinitely many other reg regions or parallel universes existing beyond our cosmic horizon where every possible cosmic history is played out. Level two is based on currently popular models of inflation that we've heard about today, featuring many other post-inflation bubble universes with different initial states, dimensionality, and physical constants. Level three, which we've also heard about today, is based on the many worlds theory of quantum physics with the exponential creation of new universes as each quantum eventuality unfolds, as Schrodinger's cat. And finally, and perhaps most provocatively, Tegmark has this idea of a level four multiverse, which is based on the idea of what he calls mathematical democracy. And this is, this is an interesting idea in which mathematical and physical reality are seen as ontologically equivalent. And every mathematical structure corresponds to a parallel universe, thus permitting, in theory, the existence of everything. <coughs> so having outlined a few multiverse ideas, I also want to say a few more words, what do I mean by participatory metaphysics? Because as I say, it's somewhat fallen out of fashion in philosophy and indeed in theology these days. So you know, the, um, the concept of participation has a long and complex history. But in essence, Christian participatory metaphysics is based on a very simple notion that everything about the world comes from God, with the exception of evil, and yet is at the same time distinct. That the structure or order of relationship between beings is such that they share in some property or perfection to varying degrees. They share in God. All finite beings participate in existence from God. This coming forth, the idea of coming forth from God, brings to mind notions of sharing, imitation, and likeness which can all be put under the broad umbrella of participation. So in this sense, the world, or perhaps even the multiverse, participates in its own transcendent source, God, the absolute source of everything. So this is the idea of ontological participation, that the reality of what is participated confers being on that which participates. And I think this is a central and critical dimension of Christian metaphysics, and it can be useful in the science and religion dialogue in general and in multiverse conversations in particular. So for example, participation necessarily entails multiplicity and diversity, and is therefore particularly apt when thinking through the different models of the multiverse that we've just seen. And I say this because the participatory vision holds that creation is diverse because a world of finite things can best bear a likeness to the infinite God through dazzling multiplicity. So participation aligns not only with multiplicity in the sense of a variety of creatures, but also perhaps 
in a variety of universes. Just as there is an internal mul multiplicity to all created things, unlike God, they're not simple and they have parts, different parts, we might extend this concept to the multiverse and its own multiplicity. So I think it's striking to note the irony that while the multiverse proposal is often invoked to abolish the need to postulate the existence of God, the desire for transcendence and eternity and affinity, infinity implicit in multiverse speculation is central to the Christian tradition. As John Hort, who is, I think, at Georgetown, has observed, it's hard not to notice what he calls the inherently religious character of such an extravagant conjecture. Like the rest of us, even scientific naturalists have a taste for eternity. Indeed, Tegmark's warning against dismissing things merely because we cannot observe them from our vantage point is almost a perfect expression of Platonism, which is properly understood as love of the unseen and the eternal. And it might equally be employed by theists arguing for the possibility of an unseen and eternal God. Given that Tegmark's hierarchy concludes with a multiverse in which the ultimate ground of existence is what he believes to be a kind of platonic realm of mathematical truth, we might first of all consider the importance of Plato and in particular, a platonic metaphysic of participation in terms of reconciling Christian theism with the multiverse proposal, particularly in light of the enormous influence of platonic thought on the development of early Christian theology. So first of all, Plato. Um, I think Platonism, like multiverse theory, is animated by the principle that there is a surplus of ultimate meaning, a kind of good beyond being, what cosmologists might call other, other, other universes. Plato's work is infused with imagery of the ascent of the soul to God, of moving from the visible and the temporal to the invisible and the eternal and to the real, and to the most real. Indeed, from Parmenides onwards, the history of ancient Greek philosophy is a search for what is real, what is eternally real over and against the world of change. And this movement from the visible to the invisible, from the temporal to the eternal, which earlier on we heard as um, a move from the particular to the universal. Um, this movement is described, for example, in the Phaedrus, in which Socrates compares the soul to a winged chariot, constantly struggling to contemplate the eternal and unchanging realm. In the Symposium, in which love is depicted as the essential element in moving the soul towards eternity, and most famously of all, of course, in the Republic, in which the fleeting, transient nature of language and knowledge like shadows in the cave, hint at the existence of eternal forms in an ultimate reality, or perhaps in multiverse language, other worlds and other dimensions. In this sense, Plato bequeathed to Christianity the notion, which was also so vital to Augustine's acceptance of the Christian faith, that we have an innate longing for a vision of the good, which, as Tegmark argues in the multiverse context, eludes our, physical, our immediate physical world and exists beyond being. So I think the concept of the forms is crucial to Plato's participatory metaphysics. He argues that behind the visible material world lies a world of forms, that behind the goodness that we see in the world there is the form of the good, that true and eternal beauty, um, beauty there with a capital B, is represented or reflected in natural beauty that we see all around us, and that human justice in somehow embodies justice with a capital J, the form of justice. Plato holds that tangible things exist as an image of and a participation in intangible and eternal forms. So Plato's forms are among the most powerful philosophical ideas ever advanced, and I think they continue to be of relevance, particularly in terms of the multiverse theory. For example, the idea of the forms uh, raises issues such as the relation of the universe to whatever lies beyond it, as its source and as its pattern. And it also raises questions about the concept of universals, that is to say, what is common between things of the same kind. Moreover, in his Timaeus, Plato uses participatory language to describe the world of becoming as a likeness of its intelligible archetype. And he explores the notion of cosmic multiplicity, is that word again, which is central to the multiverse proposal. And he does this with a cosmological vision, vision in which the entire universe is a harmonious and beautiful unity while also composed of differences and pluralities in a subtle interplay of the one and the many. In this context, the notion of participation 
secured, secured through the presence of transcendent forms in sensible images is paramount. And it might be seen as the only way to kind of bridge the gap between transcendence and imminence, or between the one and the many that comes up not only in theology and philosophy, but also in discussions about the idea of multiple worlds or multiple universes. As I mentioned a few moments ago, Tegmark's hierarchy of multiverses concludes with what he calls radical Platonism, with a level four multiverse in which all mathematical structures exist physically. While this final level is deeply philosophically and scientifically provocative, its theological implications are, I think, at once more significant and more compatible with Christian theism than is commonly appreciated, including by Tegmark himself. Intriguingly, he suggests that the debate over quantum mechanics and parallel universes is secondary to the deeper conflict between what he sees as the platonic paradigm, whereby the external mathematical perspective is real, while our internal human perspective is merely approximate, on the one hand, and the Aristotelian paradigm, on the other hand, which he sees as subordinating mathematical language to the internal perspective. And Tegmark writes, if you prefer the platonic paradigm, you should find multiverses natural. In this case, all of physics is ultimately a mathematics problem. There is a theory of everything at the top of the tree whose axioms are purely mathematical. And given that he's a mathematical physicist, it's perhaps unsurprising that his idea is framed in such uncompromisingly mathematical terms. But I think that the, the, just the fact that Tegmart sets up this, what he sees as a conflict between platonic and Aristotelian thought is particularly telling and relevant in terms of my point about participation, because of course, Aristotle rejected Plato's language of participation as merely a poetic manner of speaking, which some people in this room may also be thinking right now. Um, in a pointed rejoinder to Tegmark with clear theological overtones, uh, Paul Davies argues that there is no reason to restrict this multiverse to mathematics if it truly encompasses everything. He says that to do so invites the question of why the multiverse is mathematical, who decided that? As Keith Ward suggests, if God is conceived as a rational mind with the creative power to actualize possible mathematical structures, it's plausible to regard God as the ultimate reason for the existence of the multiverse. As such, this Platonist multiverse need not, as Ward appears to suggest, threaten theism, but rather provide a valuable basis for the formulation of a theology of creation in which God, like the Platonic laws of mathematics and physics, is understood as independently real, as the ultimate ground of reality, including all worlds and universes which participate in this ground of reality. Perhaps this approach takes Tegmart's reference to what he calls an infinitely intelligent mathematician to its logical and theological conclusion. Um, secondly, I just want to briefly say a few words about Aquinas. Um, and even though Aquinas was quite... Um, say, hostile or, or suspicious of the idea of many worlds because he was con concerned that the infinity of worlds would threaten God's infinity and also threaten the singularity of the kind of uh, hierarchy of being that I described earlier with, you know, beings in the world, animals, humans, angels, leading up to God in kind of a straight line. He thought that if there was multiple worlds and multiple universes, that would threaten the kind of verticality of that whole system. But... Participation is such a central concept of Aquinas' thought, and some of his insights are so applicable to the argument I'm making or the argument I'm suggesting that I just wanted to say a few words about him and to consider the relevance to multiverse thought of his account of variety and multiplicity, which is based on a Neoplatonic hierarchy of being and a metaphysic of participation. For Aquinas, creation participates in and reflects the nature of divine being and goodness. For example, he says the human mind is a participated likeness of the divine intellect. This metaphysic of participation expresses the proportionality between subject and object in knowledge, which is in turn grounded in the participated nature of being, which is ultimately grounded in God. Equally, division and multiplicity, as inherent features of the created universe, come from God and reflect the fact that divine goodness can only be adequately represented by diversity and by variety. Goodness in God is simple and uniform, but in creation, it is varied and divided. And in this sense, the whole universe participates in and represents divine goodness. 
Just as a single creature or thing in the universe could not sufficiently represent God's goodness, it's perhaps worth extending Aquinas' logic to explore the idea that the multiverse might be understood as a more adequate representation of divine goodness than a single universe. In this sense, his notion of the dependence of multiplicity on unity is a potentially valuable way of theologically framing the complex interplay in the multiverse proposal between the one and the many, order and disorder, and unity and difference. Now, the last figure I want to talk about is Nicholas of Cusa, who, unlike Aquinas and even Plato, was you know, a leading figure, thinker, one of the very first Western thinkers to argue for many worlds, many universes. And the ironic dialectic between the finite and the infinite, which is characteristic of the multiverse proposal, also preoccupies Nicholas of Cusa, who broke with the Aristotelian conception of a spatially limited universe to consider the concept of divine infinity and the endlessness of the world in a highly imaginative and paradoxical manner. In his case for the compatibility of the multiverse hypothesis with theism, Robin Collins argues that since God is usually considered infinite and infinitely creative, he says, it makes sense that creation would reflect these attributes and hence that physical reality might be larger than one universe. While Collins correctly identifies Cuse's exploration of infinity as a potentially fruitful device to reconcile Christian theism and multiverse thought, uh, specifically a level one multiverse of infinite space, he does not provide any further explication. For Cuse, the universe is limitless beyond conception, with God as the infinite end, representing the center and the circumference of the universe and everything in it. He writes, because, O oh Lord, you are the end that delimits all things, you are an end of which there is no end, and thus you are an end without an end, i.e. an infinite end. By speculating that the Earth is not the center of the universe, Cusa, in this sense, anticipated Copernicus's formulation of the heliocentric view, and this is a point that Bernard has made in his book, Universe and Multiverse. In imagery heavily influenced by Plato's Timaeus, Cusa conceives of the whole universe as animated by a soul emanating from God. In other words, the infinite universe participates creatively in and constitutes an unfolding of the infinite divine mind. Creation itself, on this account, is a copy of the divine image in which it participates. I think this differs subtly yet momentously from Paul Davies' claim that naive deism and the general multiverse concept will, in his words, turn out to be of equivalent complexity because they are contained within each other. But if, in line with Cusa and other medieval Christian theologians, we view the interrelationship between God and the cosmos in terms of the former providing the ultimate ground for and the source of the latter, we need not accept Davies' conflation of the two. The multiverse should not be seen as what he calls an old-fashioned God in disguise, but as an infinitely complex instantiation of the infinite creative power of God that we can begin to accept the endlessness of space and the infinity of possibility, both critical to multiverse thought, is stressed in Cusa's analogy that we cannot even express the inner truth of a stone, let alone man or God. Uh, the importance of unity as a general philosophical principle for Cusa might be employed to provide a theistic response to a common charge against the multiverse proposal, and this is something we've heard earlier on today, specifically that it violates Occam's razor or the idea that any theory should avoid unnecessary complexity. Cusa attempts to bridge the ontological gap between the traditional Neoplatonic depiction of God as eternal unity and the multiplicity of change in our physical world, the one and the many, by presenting a view of reality which combines these two aspects in a reconciliation of contradictions. So in this account, the finite is implicit in the infinite, the infinite is explicit in the finite, and thus the multiplicity of things in the universe arises out of the unity of God in which the many is the one. This notion of the dependence of multiplicity on unity is consistent with Max Tegmark's superficially counterintuitive, yet distinctly Cusean argument that the higher multiverse levels are simpler due to what Tegmark calls the symmetry and simplicity inherent in the totality of all the elements taken together. The opulence of complexity is all in the subjective perceptions of, observ of observers. Of further relevance to Tegmark in his scheme, not only does Cusa maintain that every possibility must exist, not unlike the level four multiverse that I 
mentioned earlier. Cuse's insistence on overcoming and reconciling apparent oppositions leads him to believe that all truth can be expressed in one ultimate formula, as exact and irrefutable as an equation in mathematics. Thus, we can clearly see the lineage between Cuse's own philosophy and Tegmark's contemporary emphasis on mathematical structures and a theory of everything. So having kind of considered some specific figures and the relevance of Platonism and medieval Christian theology to the contemporary multiverse debate, I just want to begin to consider some ways in which this foundation could be conceptually developed. And again, some of these concepts have come up already today. Both Collins and Hort in recent years contend that the multiverse is compatible with the traditional belief that God is infinite and infinitely creative. As discussed, Cuser developed the idea of creative participation in the divine mind, and that creativity in the cosmos, whether in the form of human creativity or the creative multiplicity of other worlds or universes, is itself a manifestation and unfolding of divine creativity. Collins adopts Cuser's analogy of God as creative artist, also evident in Aquinas' depiction of creation as an artistic product of divine workmanship, to demonstrate the validity of a theistic version of the level two inflationary multiverse scenario on the basis that an infinitely creative God would operate through some sort of universe generator, since apparently this would, according to Collins, be somewhat more elegant and ingenious than just creating them out of nothing. Similarly, Robert Spitzer argues that inflationary type multiverse proposals will likely entail fine tuning, thus increasing the likelihood of a supernatural explanation. Far from negating the need for God then, the multiverse proposal is more explicable in the context of a purposeful divine designer with a motive for creation, an artist expressing, expressing creativity and ingenuity rather than an engineer concerned only with efficiency. With God as the loving force behind the multiverse, one of Davies' primary objections to the multiverse theory, that it would probably entail fake universes, collapses, since our laws of physics reflect and exemplify divine truth and rationality. Crucially, Hort's account of divine creativity is based on the notion that the universe is itself the principal creative adventure, and that new cosmology, including new multiverse thought, is theologically consequential because it draws, upon, draws attention to the whole universe, not just the human subject. And this neatly illustrates that the multiverse theory is actually unremarkable and kind of in line with the development of scientific thought insofar as it in, um, the with the historical shift of the scientific worldview, um, or what Bernard Carr has referred to as the outward journey, and he talked about that earlier from uh, a progression from a geocentric to a heliocentric to a galacticocentric to a cosmocentric to the recent move towards the multiverse view. Hort provides a powerful reminder that evolutionary biology, earth science, and cosmology <coughs> indicate a universe still in the making, with creation as an ongoing dynamic process. He says, in the light of science, theology may confidently affirm that creation is still happening. He therefore proposes a theology of creation of direct applicability to the multiverse proposal, in which God's selfless, self-emptying love seeks something other than itself in the form of a still unfinished universe in the making, granted an immensity of space and time in which to become distinctively itself as something other than God. And finally, I just want to talk about the idea of beauty and elegance as it relates to participatory thoughts and the multiverse. And the idea that the multiverse might be construed as evidencing not only God's infinite creativity, but also, in some ways, divine beauty and elegance. For example, Hort's Whiteheadian cosmological vision is of a universe or a multiverse with a purpose, aiming under the stimulus of a divine persuasive love towards ever more intense instances of beauty. Although Collins doubts that the elegance and beauty of the laws of nature could be preserved in a level four multiverse, we've seen that in the Platonic tradition, the entire physical universe or multiverse is a harmonious and beautiful unity, an image of the perfect divine mind. To return to Socrates' image of the soul as a winged chariot, it's capable of soaring to infinity and participating in the, in the divine, which for Plato is beauty, wisdom, goodness, and all such qualities. By these, then, the wings of the soul are nourished and grow. 
Likewise, Augustine, who draws on the Platonic doctrine of participation, argues that visible beauty points to its invisible source, and that truth, or knowledge, is a kind of participation of the beautiful in the beauty of God. And this Augustinian um, conception of beauty is something that we heard in uh, Dr. Pinson's talk this morning. So, to conclude, um, uh, there's a Nobel um, physicist whose name I will probably mispronounce called Sheldon Glashow. Sheldon Glashow. Um, and he said about multiverse proponents that their approach seems to me more like medieval theology than science. I think this is unintentionally unironic, insofar as the growing interest <laughs> in multiverse theories should, as I've been suggesting here today, prompt a serious reconsideration of how medieval theology and other foundational theologies and philosophies might be newly pertinent in terms of overcoming the, I think, easy or mistaken assumption that Christian theism is incompatible with the multiverse. So in light of the growing mainstream acceptability of the multiverse proposal in modern science, my project is to draw on key thinking, sorry, the thinking of some of these key theological figures and to develop a participatory metaphysic of creation that would illuminate the compatibility of Christian theism and the multiverse. And I think this way of bringing ancient theology to a contemporary issue in science can represent an example of how the science-religion dialogue can be enriched by ancient and medieval theology. Thank you.